when I go to Miami, um, we come back along Alligator Alley, and my husband drives, and I sit and I look out the window, and I count alligators. <laughs> I go, alligator, 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 big alligator, <laughs> baby alligator, alligator, alligator. When they're all piled together, you have to go alligator, alligator, alligator. So, um, so when I know there's this man in town who has two books with the name alligator in them, and he wears an alligator shirt, <laughs> and he ties that all to the identity of Florida and our town, St. Petersburg, um, I couldn't resist because that's what our town's all about. Our town's about how the identity of this place and all the people in it and all the things in it get shaped. And who better than Jeff Klinkenberg, the expert storyteller. So please yeah. welcome Jeff Klinkenberg. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> so I'll start with the first question, as always. So how did you get to St. Petersburg? Um, I was invited to work at the Camp of Eight Times, which is known as the St. Petersburg Times, in 1977 by Eugene Patterson, who was the editor at the time. <clears throat> and he had worked uh, at the Washington Post and been a college professor. And he had come to the St. Pete Times uh, at the bequest of Nelson Pointer. And uh, Patterson was trying to build a staff of storytellers. So I was very flattered to be asked to come to the Times <laughs> from Miami. I, I was working on a small afternoon newspaper that is no more called the Miami News. I grew up in Miami. So, um, and I'd grown up in a way that I, I think is, people still do, but very hot finish. Um, seriously, and some of you who grew up in St. Petersburg, and I know I see some of you uh, out here uh, know that you didn't wear shoes, and sometimes <laughs> you didn't wear a shirt, and I grew up that way. So down there, I fished and I camped and I started watching birds and was interested in plants. And I've been, been the, uh, I covered professional football, for God's sake. But uh, I quit that job. I hated it. And I said, I want to be, I want to write about the outdoors. And other journalists said, are you crazy? You've got, you're 22 years old, you've got the great beat, the great sports beat covering professional football. But it wasn't to me, I mean, the, the, uh, there were some players who were really nice, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't real storytelling, it was writing articles. <clears throat> and the thing about writing about the outdoors was, and especially in the South, where there's this culture of storytelling, um, it just seemed like this great opportunity. So I started writing outdoor stories at the Miami News. Not always very well. Um, that was sort of the, you'll notice the, 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 the back end of what we call the front page journalism era, where you basically, they wanted a, a story five, six times a week sometimes, and it was hard to do what I wanted to do. Um, five or six of these kinds of stories a week because of the travel and you had to hang out with people. So I was doing it there, I wasn't very happy, and Patterson said, come on up here. We'll give you the space and we'll give you the time to write stories. So I did. So were you trained as a journalist? Did you go to university? I did. I, I graduated from the University of Florida in 1971. Uh, I was one of those lucky kids who knew what I wanted to do, even when I was little. Uh, my parents were not educated people. They did not graduate from high school. But they did value uh, reading, uh, especially newspapers. And so they always had newspapers. Uh, and, and back in the, in the 50s, of course, um, most towns had at least two newspapers in Miami. That was true in Miami. And actually, there, were, there, were, there was a third paper in my neighborhood, too. 
So I was reading newspapers. My parents were always reading newspapers. And I started doing a neighborhood newspaper <laughs> when I was 10 years old. I still have some of them. Uh, Circulation 2, by the way. I <laughs> <laughs> hand, the, the way the monks do. But the other thing you told me uh, was that your mom was a storyteller. My mother was a storyteller. Uh, the astonishing uh, Beatrice Mary Grace O'Donnell Quickenberg. Uh, second generation American, but Irish in all her sensibilities. She had all the virtues and all the vices, and I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, my dad was an outdoorsy guy. They, these are two, there were two city people from Chicago, by the way. We moved to Florida in 1951 when I was two, and they, took, they both had, they had, they had these separate reactions to coming to Florida. Uh, my dad was, wow, I'm in Florida, I'm in Hemingway land, and I'm going to really fish now, and I'm going to swim, and I'm going to be bare chested, and I love, and I, don't, I don't mind that we don't have air conditioning. I'll just take my shirt off and, and you know, barefoot, and we had coconut trees. It was like the, it was like the Florida dream, the post-World War II Florida dream. My mother was, Ernie, what have you done? <laughs> you've, moved up, you've moved us to this hell hole. There's no air conditioning. I open the, the kitchen drawer and roaches spill out. And there's banana slugs on the wall. But what she did to have is she like walked down that street, northeast 110th Terrace, northeast Miami. And she'd come back an hour later and she just knew everybody's business. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, and she, you know, she, her hair would be in body pins, you know. And she'd have her palm balls, and she'd have her a half a Dunkin' grapefruit, you know, or kind of an ashtray, oh, you know, and <laughs> with her palm ball, and she'd say, "Well, let me tell you what I learned from Mrs. Posner. <laughs> she was an opera singer, but now her daughter won't talk to her. You know? So she would read these stories that had beginning." A middle and a penny. They were real stories. And it's exactly what you do. It's, I have like the perfect parents. You just don't just go down the street. You go all around our state. Yes, although sometimes I've gone down the street. Uh, so, um, so one of the things that you've said is that education, reading at home, going to university, and probably was elementary school and high school, were they um, important to you? You know, they were, but in a, a negative way. And um, it's hard for me to, to, to make light of this because uh, I was not a natural student. And I have to tell you, I mean, I just, for whatever reason, I was looking out the window all the time and drawing pictures of fish. So I was doing, and I went to a parochial school, and this was in the 50s, and those of you who went to parochial schools, knew those nuns, in my case, the Dominican nuns, many of them Irish, um, you know, they didn't tolerate round pegs in a square peg world. So I did, I joked, I learned, I, I invented the, uh, the, uh, the rope again, you know, because it was always getting slug, you know. <clears throat> and so that, and I had some, I had some disabilities, especially the numbers, and I still do where I look at numbers and I transpose them. Uh -huh. And I have to be very careful with that. So I was a pretty miserable, uh, I was just miserable in school. I was one of those kids who was always... Did you tell stories in school? Did well, you joke the, around? The one thing I did well was I, I wrote good stories. So that was my saving grace. And in high school, um, I started writing for the newspaper mm -hmm. and did well on that. And, you know, I never thought I was going to go to college, but uh, I was able to go to college. Well, I started answering phones at a little newspaper. It wasn't a little newspaper, it was a big newspaper paper then. It's called the Miami News. When I was 16 years old, and so uh, from there, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would uh, uh, you know, people would call in with scores and stuff, and I'd write little stories and. I ended up uh, getting a scholarship, scholarship help to first the community college and then later at the University of Florida. But you know, it was it, it was not easy, um, and I really had to do a lot of catch up. 
and I somehow graduated from the University of Florida. And I have to say, most of my education, and maybe this is true for a lot of adults, was like the stuff that went over my head or I just wasn't interested in, I learned afterwards. And maybe, you know, sometimes that may be better. And, uh, you know, because when you grow up, you know, feeling perhaps a little inferior, um, and suddenly you discover this little gleam of talent, that ambition just burns in your belly. You know, you're, you're determined to make up for lost time. And that was the case for me. It's interesting. Um, I'm asking you a lot about your education <coughs> early, how you learned early in the reading, because there's a pattern that seems to happen with the guests to our town, is that that early education becomes very important. Um, what families did, mm -hmm. and also, there's also very interesting things that a lot of very creative people don't do very well in the high school, junior high, and then there's something that pushes them over and um, they become stars. Um, I mean, you're very, you know, you know, you were invited to come to the art newspaper and you have all these books published and all these people come to see you. And there's something that happened. And we've seen that a lot. And it's one of the issues that keep coming up in our town, the value of education. And um, everyone's concerned about that. How do we educate, you know, our future of, of our country and the world? And the stories are very reassuring that sometimes if you don't look like you're so great when you're young, you can still be a Jeff <coughs> So, I mean, that's, I think, a good story. Yeah, well, thank you. And I know some wonderful teachers now, and I see some of them uh, in this room. And, you know, the 50s was different than now. And Well, let's see, <coughs> how many people are teachers here? Professors, <coughs> school teachers? <coughs> you are, or were teachers. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I may be wrong, but I do think teachers today maybe pay attention to, to, to special, to students who may not be excelling in the way that the other students are, but they have something. There's that, there's that, uh, that Emersonian gleam, <laughs> and they push them. I, I know a, a wonderful artist, Tarquin Springs, uh, named Christopher Still. I don't know if he's ever been here. But uh, Chris in school had, had some of the same, he had reading disabilities. When he looked at a page of writing, he focused in on the space between the words. And uh, he had a teacher in, uh, in high school who, who wasn't teaching art, it was something else, but gave him time during class to work on his art. And maybe he didn't graduate uh, as as rounded as they would like, but you know, it, uh, he, he he left having some confidence. And it's and it's followed him through his career. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when you came to St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. what was it like? Well, I came in '77, and, and I, I see people in this room who've been here a long time and know, uh, especially downtown. I mean, it was sort of a ghost town, wasn't it? I'm, um, after 5 p.m., I mean, the, you know, the, the streets of downtown were empty. So it's pretty amazing to see, to live in St. Petersburg now, this uh, vibrant town. Um, so what did people do? I mean, now everyone just goes down and walks back and forth on Beach Drive. But well, how many people well, do that? People, well, people downtown, people still did, did, that, did that, but during the day. And I'll tell you about somebody that, when I first moved here, I used to see all the time. I remember, I came here in 77, and I, I was Gene Patterson's outdoors writer. He was a southern boy. He grew up in the south. Uh, he valued the outdoors. So I was looking for stories. 
And there used to be this guy when I first moved here. You'd see walking along the water, pushing a shopping cart, usually with fish. And he had this big uh, gig. It's like a spear with four prongs on it. And you could see rope. And you would have noticed this guy even without the, the gig because he was seven feet tall. And he walked with a lens. Anybody ever see him? Yeah, like I see. Well, I used, to, I used to see him and I would think, and this is, this still goes on with me. You know, you look at people and you say, I wonder what that person's story is. Um, and I would see this guy and he had this tremendous length. Um, and what happened to him? Why is he doing this? Is he selling fish? I have all these questions. And uh, I started asking about it. There was a little bait house out at the end of the pier, and nobody knew his name. They just called him Slim. And, you know, well, you know, I said, where can I find him? Well, I don't know. He just shows up sometime. But you might look for him at Mastery's Bar and Grill. Oh. <laughs> Every, you know, everything in town, sooner or later, goes to Mastery's. So I went down. And that's on Central. It was, yeah, it was, it was on Central then, but on a different side of the street. So I went in there, and Lane Masters, who was alive, who started that bar, said, I don't know his name, Slam, he comes in here, he pulled a knife on somebody one day, and I kicked him out. Uh, but if he comes in here, I'll tell him you're looking for him. So, I don't know, weeks go by, I'm doing other stuff. One night I'm driving out on the pier, and I see him, and he's got his cart, and he's got his gig, and he's got a his shopping cart is full of sheep's head. There are tasty fish, they're a little bony, they're hard to clean, but they're tasty. And he was selling them. And eventually, he would always like walk down Central Avenue West and sell fish along the way. But I caught him out in here. So I had this Volkswagen bus. One of many, really, a, a bad vehicle. But I, <laughs> <laughs> so I pull, I pull off the road and I kind of walk in front of him, and, and, and I'm just kind of leaning at the, um, leaning on the pier, and he's like working his way toward me. And finally, gets close, and I turn and I say, Hi, I'm, and he said, I know who you are. I'm not going to talk to you. Oh. F off. <laughs> <laughs> So he's got a kid, he's got a big knife on his side. I decided this time I was going to let him off with us. <laughs> I didn't bother him. And, you know, I would see him, and I would hear stories about him sleeping in a skiff under the boat, he was virtually homeless, or sleeping under the St. Pete Yacht Club uh, uh, docks and stuff. But I sort of forgot about him, and then I stopped seeing him. And then a couple years ago, and this is this this is how the, the story, so the genesis of the story. Sometimes, you know, it takes it, it, it's many years in uh, in the making, and you start thinking of old memories and stuff. And when uh, the city first started talking about uh, tearing down the old pier, I thought of him immediately as sort of an icon of that pier. <clears throat> um, Without knowing any of his history, I just remember I used to see him on that pier the whole time. It's whenever it was, 2009 or whatever. Um, probably most pe some people will remember, others won't. I think I'm going to try to tell this story. But of course, I was beginning from scratch because all I knew, I just knew this seven foot guy named Slim. Uh, we actually put a little ad in the paper and I uh, got no responses. <clears throat> so I just started going in. And, you know, maybe because, um, and this is just me speculating, Carol, I don't know, but <clears throat> because I grew up a, a certain way, you know, where, where um, you know, fish and fishing and catching snakes and all that kind of stuff was sort of my refuge from being lonely, you know. <coughs> I sort of, I felt this empathy for somebody like that. And, you know, people like that, if you look at alligators and be flat, I mean, those people do attract me. 
And so I ended up writing about about Slim. So what we just listened to, it's sort of a, you know, a, a experienced storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I mean I've heard this story, I've read this story, and yet I am so like I can't stop listening and looking and following this and and it intrigues me why stories, I mean, the people we don't know, you know, why they really grab us. And, um, and why someone like you has this way of weaving that. That, to me, is really fascinating about human beings. Mm -hmm. How much stories are so important to who we are and how we create our world. So this man, Slim, will always be sort of part of our view of St. Petersburg. Um, I find that intriguing. But I also find it intriguing with that story is that um, that story is based on testimony from other people. Mm -hmm. You know nothing about what went on in his head and choices he made and beliefs. It's all based on a, a, a construct. And it's also the case with stories. Like, if you do crossword puzzles, if the clue says story or tale, the answer is always why. You know? Thank you. <laughs> if nothing, you got something out of this. <laughs> so is this What's the relationship of truth in this story? I mean, that guy could have been completely different, but yet, that's what you just told us is who we take as that man, Slim, that man on the yeah. here. Well, I, I see one thing is that, and this is one of the things I got out of killing Mr. Watson, just how unknowable people are. We just think we do. Or, and if I tell you that, you know, for a fact that Slim was blah, 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 blah. I mean, there's there's outward manifestation of him that I can say he carried a gig, he did this, but it's, you know, it's hard. You, you just can't get into him, you know. And you probably can't get into anybody, really. Mm -hmm. You know, you just can't, you just can't do it. But, of course, that's not a, that's not a failing. I mean, that's, that's the human story, you know. That's just part of but yet we want it so bad. We want to know. You know, we want to know. And, and I mean, the thing about stories, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, is that since, you know, we got up, you know, from our knuckles dragging uh, and then sat down again in front of a fire. I mean, we, the homo sapiens have been telling stories, so it's in our blood. And it's how we understand the world around us, with legends or things that seem true or are true to the best of our knowledge. And that's how we we get through this veil of tears. Uh, so when you're at home um, with your wife, Susan King, uh, where are you? She's hiding. She, okay. Look, she's, she's in the back of the room in case yeah, you had to run. <laughs> <laughs> so do you tell her stories, or does she say to you, Tell me a story. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me about Slim one more time. No, I, 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 I do. I do. Uh, you know, especially um, certain ones that I'm really excited about. Um, where you can, you know, there's stories. There's, you know, and I, I write for a newspaper, which means I'm sort of writing on demand, basically. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes my do you, have, do you have to write? <coughs> I mean, you just don't present the story. It's like, okay, next Tuesday. I well, it's, it's changed over many years. When I first started at the time, so, uh, when I started uh, writing the, the Florida culture stories, there were the sections we called Floridian, the Floridian section every day. And then it went to every Sunday. And now it's once a month. And it's a tabloid, so there's not as much space. So I'm really not sure what's going to happen. Um, 
I do write some stories for the, the, the A section or the B section sometimes, but I'm, I'm basically writing for a flirty section. Um, so some stories, uh, I, you know, I know I'm going to have a story in every one of those Floridians. Um, and sometimes they're stories that excite me. Sometimes they're stories that I've been doing this for a long time and I'm going to use all my skill and my craft to tell a good story. Um, other stories, like Slim, you know, you get ex I'm excited about it. You hope you might be able to lift that storytelling from craft into some art. And so those stories are different. And the stories that are different for me are stories that have a bunch of levels to them. There are some stories that you know, that seem like they have one level. And, and, and sometimes those are the, that's what attracts me initially. And the story that closes the book is about a woman named Lillian Stella, who's 75 now, today, lives in St. Petersburg. Um, a couple years ago, uh, someone I know was in a Publix, Publix in the Northeast, the big, the big one, and ran into this tiny woman in the Cape Cod, and just started talking to her about what she wanted to buy. And this tiny woman, like four foot eleven, had a Polish accent. It was very chatty, and in about a ten-minute conversation, told this woman that she had been a burlesque dancer and pretty famous. And she called herself Chesty Morgan. Um, she was known for having the largest natural bust in show business. So I hear about that. Uh, forgive me, forgive me my, my crass uh, maleness. But I hear this and I think, I can write something about this. <laughs> Uh, my friend Carl Heisen says, sooner or later, everybody moves to Florida. So, um, so I can, you know, it's not exactly what I usually write about, but I can, I can, I can stretch, you know, for that. So I started doing public record searches and finding out her last name is Stella. And, there are pictures in the book. <laughs> so I find her and I, and I call her and she's not excited about hearing from me. Uh, she's, she's had a life that was extremely public, but now she's retired. She lives in this town. She's got a daughter who's a lawyer in Tampa. She's got a granddaughter, Shortcrest. But for some reason, she agrees to meet me and meet at Publix. You know, it's a safe thing. Until I start to talk to her and find out, my goodness, I mean, her. Her parents are murdered in the Holocaust. She's Polish. She's hidden. She eventually is smuggled out of Poland to Israel and you know, grows to be a teenager there and then marries the first American, comes along, takes her to the United States. And he's a he's a successful butcher in Brooklyn. And they have two kids, and they're small, and they have a pretty good life. So she makes some money. And then one day she gets a phone call and finds out that in this bizarre robbery where these three butchers were pushed into a deep freeze and then shot that her husband has been murdered. Mm -hmm. And she screams and hits her head against the wall. And she thinks about killing herself, but she can't because she has two kids. So some time goes by. She grieves. And she really doesn't have, she's got some money because her husband died. And he was fairly prosperous, but she's worried. She's got two little girls to raise. Um, she wonders what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my girls. She's voluptuous, so she has lots of suitors. But the last thing she wants to do is to get involved with somebody because in her experience, 
you get involved with somebody where you love them and then they die. So she's not going to do that. But she has this one suitor who's persistent. His name is Maury. And Maury wants to marry her. Maury is Smith. Maury, you know, we can get married. I'll take care of your kids. Oh, no, Maury. I can't marry you. And, you know, some time goes by. And, and she tells Maury one day, maybe, you know, maybe if I had a way of making a living, if I had something I could do, where I could feel empowered. I would feel better about myself, and then maybe, who knows, maybe we could get married one day. So, Maury makes his move. And it's something I'm sure he came to regret. <laughs> but he takes her to a nightclub, and he says, you know, Lillian, you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, Maury, I never speak to you again. <laughs> and so she doesn't. But she thinks about it. And so she was sort of Madonna before there was a Madonna. She decided, well, hell, I'm going to do this. And she didn't know how to dance. She didn't know how to sing. She didn't know how to talk to people. But she learned. And in the 70s, holy shit, so she was at a Fellini movie. Uh, uh, Fellini saw her and went to her, uh, saw her in New York and said, I want you to be in Fellini's Casanova starring down in Southern, went to Rome. Uh, her scene was cut out to the film, but you can see it, you can Google it. And you can see Casanova chasing her around the table with all, in all her glory. <laughs> um, so she danced all over the world, every place. And uh, she was in a couple of them. There, there was a, Ed Wood, if you heard of Ed Wood, the, the, the director who was bad on purpose. Mm -hmm. well, there, was a, there was a female counterpart named Doris Wishman who made these movies that were like so bad they were wonderful. <laughs> and she made a couple of movies with Lillian. Um, like Double 73, kind of a spy film where <laughs> guns came out of or <laughs> so, those were those were out there too. But here is the interesting thing about her, about Lillian. You know, I've already told you these amazing things. It was how, and here I'm taking her word for it, but I believe her that she sort of resisted um, drugs, and it, I, I mean, it, you know. The, this was not uh, high culture. And she had agents, and there were always people who were trying to get her on the cheap. And here, we can give you cocaine instead of money, which she wanted the money, because she had kids. And so she was saving her money. And, um, and she eventually did marry again a, a major league umpire. Uh -huh. Named Richard Stella, who had a place in Florida because of spring training. So that's how she came to Florida. And she, she stopped dancing in 1991, the night that uh, we started to bomb Iraq. So she was in her 50s. And she decided, I mean, she, she, was, richer than, she was richer than the Pope. And she had apartment building. She had an apartment building in New York, which she sold. Can you imagine how much that <laughs> money, uh, how much money she made? And she had a couple of uh, apartment buildings here, which she still has. And so um, she has so many, she has a hard time trusting people, just given what has happened to her, that she's afraid of being cheated. So. She does most of her um, work in her apartments by herself. Uh, she does it alone. Or she has she has a friend that she really trusts. But one of my interviews with her, and I did many interviews with her because it was very hard, uh, was on the roof of an apartment building with her tarring roof, mm -hmm. Chesty Morgan tarring roof, wearing yellow rubber gloves and. 
I said, Lily, I never saw your act. What was it like? And she said, Oh, honey, I have more, I have better costume than Liberace. I come to the back of the room, I take off my jacket, I take off my, she animized that. So, uh, uh, Scott Keeler, who took the, photog the, the, the photographs, uh, and I just worked very, very, very hard on that, just kind of getting it right, the compassion line. And I had started out with, gosh, here's this woman who's got the, the world's largest brains, and she lives in St. Petersburg. Therefore, I'm going to write about her. <laughs> but of course, nobody is that simple. And she was a, 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 a especially complicated, and uh, so we, we, we wrote that piece. And when you write a story, um, very often people call you right away and they tell you, I like that or you didn't get that right or blah, 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 blah. It's very common. Uh, and sometimes people don't call you and they may like it. They just don't know what to say or whatever. So when people don't call, um, my feelings are hurt. But I, I liked her and she was, she's, you know, she's uh, a very interesting person and there were lots of things about her that I admired. And I wanted her to like it. And I didn't hear from her. So I called her one day around Christmas time. And she said, I said, Lily, it's Jeff Clintonburg. I just wanted to make sure you'd seen this, you saw the story. And she said, Oh, hi, I, I wish you could have given me a better writer. Really? <laughs> <laughs> broke my heart. <laughs> but it turned out she didn't like the photographs we, we published. And, um, she, and and she, she, we, we took a beautiful portrait of her at the Holocaust Museum. And there was one photo of her working on a roof, which she didn't like. But we, she had promised to give us a show business photograph that we could publish. And she kept delaying it. I think she was trying to delay the story. And she kept delaying it, and I had deadlines. And eventually, we bought something that wasn't a particularly good photograph, and she didn't like it. So anyway, a couple years go by, I put together this book, and I wanted her to end that book, a book full of diversity, from animals to people to experiences, the things that you can experience if you take advantage of living in Florida. This is the best, the best book I've ever done, and I wanted her to close it. And I sent her a copy, and not really expecting much, but she did, she called me. And she told me that when the story first came out in the paper, she hadn't liked it. But then all her friends loved it. And this often happens with elderly people especially. And it's very, it's hard to be written about. Uh, Carol's been written about, I've been written about. And, you know, there's always something, you know, that you don't think they got right. <laughs> and so, but she said, uh, and so, so people don't like that initially, but then you start to hear from family and friends who say, wow, that was really good, they, he really understood you, and so she liked it, and she loved being in the book, and she told me she'd been, she's been, um, all her friends have bought the book, and, and she's signing the book. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not taking credit for the other side. But anyway, um, so I've met, I've met, we've met a couple times, and she wants me to write a book about her. I don't know if that will happen, but who knows what, what's going to happen at the times. I just don't know. Uh, but she's even, uh, she's even uh, wooed me with one of her lemon chiffon cakes, <laughs> which, which is how the story began, really. Somebody meeting her in the cake aisle. And I have to tell you, it's like the, it's the greatest lemon chiffon cake I've ever eaten, and so she has many skills. <laughs> 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 about these other people and you tell them you know over and you write about them and it's so interesting that you ha it's like you love these people and you just um, 
just can't stop yourself from telling their stories. How is that for you inside? I mean, where are you? And, and then there's all these people that, you know, you know them so intimately. Yeah, that's really an interesting question. I, by the way, I love this tonight. I've, I've talked about things I've never talked about in front of people, uh, other than uh, Susan. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, some, some, there are things about Lillian I did not like. That are better, better, but, but, you know, you have compassion for her. I mean, she has, you know, these terrible things that happen to her. Um, she has all these kooky... Uh, she gets her news from uh, from Fox News and things like that. <laughs> and so she, you know, she'll be talking, and then she'll suddenly like explode about, you know, I know he's a Muslim. You know, you know, uh, Sean Hannity, I would love to marry him. So I don't share her beliefs, but I put that. I put that in. That's just part of who she is. So I put that in the in the uh, in my in that story. That's part of who she is. So. So there's, you know, I don't love everything about him, but I mean, we're all so flawed, and, and, and me especially, uh, trust me. Um, so but these other people, like, here's a contrast. Terry Tomlin was my guest, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Terry Tomlin writes stories, mm -hmm. but they're all about him. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, so all they're all about him. Him going on this adventure and what happens to him and his pals. But he writes about himself and what he does. Mm -hmm. You, like, in the book, this book, the new book, mm -hmm. like this, how many pages is this? 300 and some. I should have charged more money. About, <laughs> about six pages are about him. Yeah. Right? <coughs> and then everything else is about other people. And Every time I ask you things, you talk about other people. So I find this very intriguing. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm in every one of those stories. You are. I mean, most of these stories, only I would write. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a newspaper. I work for a newspaper many times. I don't consider myself a newspaper reporter. I'm still that round. And why is it hey, that these are the only, only you would write these? Because... It's my vision of what Florida is. It's my sensibilities. It's those people who attract me. And I mean, the, the uh, Florida's a complicated place. Uh, I love Carl Heisen. He's a. I'm just a fan of his. Um, when if he were, were talking here, he would talk about. Uh, I don't have to make anything up. Florida is this weird place, blah, 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 blah. And I love those novels. And I love Skink. Oh, yeah. and, and, and you write about Skink. Yeah, there's uh, the real guy, the real Skink is in there. Um, but um, and that's become this national narrative of Florida as just the weirdo capital of the world. And we certainly have part of that. That's Part of that is true. But this is a complicated state. Um, underneath all the all the, the, the glitter and the popular culture is this place where climate and animals and unusual people. Um, it's 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 Florida culture on the on the grassroots level. Everything else is just on top. And so when we have a storm and we lose our power. Oh God, there's no air conditioning. Then we suddenly realize where we live. But, but this, I'm in all of these stories, in, in, in a manner of speaking. My favorite nonfiction writer on earth, uh, the guy who had a great deal of uh, influence on me, was a guy who wrote for the New Yorker magazine for 62 years. Uh, his name was Joseph Mitchell. And he started writing in 1930, and he wrote till 19. He, he was on the staff till 1992. I think his last story was actually in the 60, 60s, though. And he wrote about he, he wrote about New York, but it was not about the Damien 
came and run to New York. It wasn't about it was happening in Broadway. It was just it was sort of the waterfront. It was the the you know Maisie, the the woman who was uh, selling tickets at the movie theater. It was people in the Bowery. And when he retired, someone asked him about his work, and he said, you know, he said, I never realized until I put this collection together. And there's a collection of his work in print that I always recommend to, to young writers. It's called Up in the Old Hotel. And he, he, he told this interviewer, when he was putting that story together, putting that book together, he realized he was always writing about himself. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so I think there's some of that in there because I don't, you know, I don't get assignments. I mean, I just sort of follow my own interests, and those. Well, it is the case, as you say, that the people you write about, or the things you write about. One of my favorite is about this bear who has a jar on his head. Sure, okay. <laughs> like hug the bear. It's not a good idea. Um, but they're all a little quirky. And um, and from knowing you, I don't know you super well, but I think you see yourself as being a little quirky. Like, because of how you... What do you think, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think that you're right. Even though you're talking about the other people, you're really talking about how do I fit in the world? Well, the other thing too, and and this isn't this is this is true of me, but other really good writers I know. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, and she's a great journalist, is a woman at the Times, uh, Lady Gregory. Uh, she's won a Pulitzer, and um, one of the, you know Lane. One of the qualities I think Lane and I have is when we we, we do these stories where we often immerse ourselves in somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. And we sort of look for that the human humanity that we might share. Because we're trying to understand who this person is and where they're coming from. Sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we just you just can't get there. There might be something too dark or something sick or whatever. Or you just don't quite get that you just don't quite get it. But often you find that thing. And you sort of uh, use that as a basis to kind of explore avenues in the story. Newspaper storytelling, when I went to journalism school, I mean, we would learn, we, we learn the five W's mm -hmm. and the H. What, when, where, why, and how. And you were supposed to get that in the first three paragraphs. And the idea was, <clears throat> back in the old days, uh, of letterpress, where they had these metal the, the types, rows of types were the metal, was that if your story was too long, it could just cut from the bottom. <laughs> so you want the important stuff in the, in, in the, uh, in the beginning. So, but that's the antithesis of storytelling. <clears throat> and so early on, you know, when I came here to the Times and Gene Patterson, and there were some really fine storytellers that he had hired. Howell Raines, who later became the editor of the New York Times, uh, Dudley Clendenin, who later went to the New York Times. There were a number of people um, who knew how to tell stories and could tell them in these unusual ways. Uh, it was like, I'm not going to write the five W's, and, and I'm going to have all that stuff in there, but I'm going to write it. You know, I'm going to think of myself as Joseph Mitchell or, or Homer. Uh, whatever, and you know, I want you to read this story to the end. I don't care who you are. Um, I, I want to see if I can keep you into this story, and, and maybe you'll learn more than the facts. Maybe you'll, you'll learn something about being a, a human being, and that's kind of goes back to uh, Neanderthals uh, mm -hmm. sitting in front of a. The fire writing about saber tooth cats. I wrote about four of them. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your love of the alligator. It's hard to imagine Florida without the alligator. It sort of makes Florida Florida for me. And 
and you know, one of the things uh, I do a lot of talks around Florida and travel, you know, all over Florida, and you know, I do meet people, especially like in some of the big cities, who say, "Wow, it must be really a downer for you to do what you do because Florida's gone." And I never quite know what to say because I don't think Florida's gone. Florida's been changed profoundly, and there's lots of things that have changed in a really bad way. But there's some things that haven't. The alligator is one of them. When I was a kid, you didn't see alligators in Florida. They had been almost wiped out. They were an, they were an endangered species. They'd been hunted to near extinction. So when I was so a kid, so I wouldn't be able to go alligator, alligator, alligator. No, no. Well, but alligator alley was built in '67, and the alligator started to come back, and you know they did call it alligator alley. alligator. <coughs> when I was like a, a a young teen, and we'd be going to the Everglades to bass fish, if I saw an alligator, I'd come home and I'd call my friends, and I'd tell them. Uh, crocodiles. Nobody knew there were crocodiles, and we have there's a native crocodile in Florida. Uh, last summer, we had one in, in, uh, in Tampa Bay. It was documented in Tampa Bay. They, they're expanding their range. They're coming back to their historic range. Uh, bear, black bears are all over the place now, to a point where they're, they're crossing paths with too many people. And there's a, there's a problem, which was the, the story about Jarhead, the, 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 the cutaway garbage. Um, and I told this whole big story about Bears and and development. Uh -huh. um, <coughs> Panthers. And when I moved here in '77, nobody could tell you for sure, biologists, if we still had Florida panthers. They thought we did. And you know, you would have people who would call me from St. Petersburg who said, "I just saw a black panther in my alley," and you knew they hadn't because we're talking about wilderness animals and they're not black, they're the color of deer. <clears throat> but in the late 70s, he finally, they got this guy from Texas, who was a famous cat catcher, who caught cats all over the world for scientists, who came to Florida, and he caught a panther, and he put a radio collar on it. And we, you know, And where did he catch it? He caught it down in southwest Florida in the big cypress. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, the, the, uh, we, have, we know we have about 100 to 140 in southwest Florida, but they have saturated the range. So the, the young males, if they stay there, they will be killed by the dominant males, just like tomcats. Mm -hmm. A tomcat will not tolerate another tomcat in the neighborhood. So these young males are swimming across the Caloosahatchee River. They've gone all the way up into Georgia. We know where they are. They have radio collars. People don't see them. They're looking for girlfriends. <laughs> the females don't are, are much more the homebodies. They don't swim across that river. Mm -hmm. So these males are going up there. They don't find girlfriends. They find new territories, but no girls. So they come back and then they're hit by cars or they're killed by male other the, the dominant male panthers. So it's an it's an interesting problem. So you have more panthers than we've had probably over a century, but they're kind of stuck in an area. And if I was the benevolent dictator, what I would do is I would catch some females and take them across the river. <laughs> That's just me. A lot of people don't want a 150 pound, seven foot cat wandering around. I see. So. It's all University of Florida Gators would take them to Athens, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? You know, but but back to your question. I mean, the alligator is the to me. It's like the the, the mega farm. Okay. And I mean, just think about think about a lot. You know, we're in the the Dali Museum for God's sake tonight, and we've got USF over here. We've got. Tropicana Field, we've got all these art galleries in Central Avenue, um, and you could go swimming. In fact, I think you should, some of you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You go swimming. <laughs> go swimming tonight in Lake Mavoy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and, 
We had dinosaurs we did. in the midst of this Imagine civilization. The and you can be eaten by a dinosaur <laughs> in Florida. We're different. We're not. Yeah. We ain't no bean bag. <laughs> so that's so, the, the, the alligator. Okay. So who has a question for Jeff? We have about uh, 10, 12 minutes. Who has a question? There's got to be a question. I'll try to embarrass you. Oh. <laughs> I grew up in Fort Myers and uh, do you want to stand up alone? Is it hard for you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the microphone though? Yes, microphone. I grew up in Fort Myers a long time ago and it's not on I it. am aware of all the all the things. Is it not on? It's not a green Okay, I see it. Sorry. Oh, there we go. For the third time, I grew up in Fort Myers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of all the um, flora and fauna that mm -hmm. you have been describing. And when I read that the um, um, Board of Control universities and so forth were going to uh, establish a university and did establish it, Florida Gulf Coast University down there, I was horrified. I thought all those young people running around there, somebody's going to be eaten by an alligator. <laughs> what do you think about it? Do you think it was irresponsible of them? Well, I was worried most about the panther because the, 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 uh, the thing about wildlife is it's all about protecting habitat. And alligators, I mean, there's, there's a couple of million of them. And the, the, those students, uh, you know, somebody could go swimming in the wrong place and be eaten. But um, they're much more likely to, to to drink too many beers and get in an accident. <laughs> but, the, the, but, but there are lots of alligators and there aren't that many panthers. So it's all about whatever the animal is or a plant. It's all about protecting habitat. One of the, the one of the great things in the last couple of years was uh, I've got this friend named Carlton Ward. He's a he's a wonderful photographer, and he um, he's been blessed with money to spend on things that make Florida a better place. And a couple of years ago. He did this trip with a bunch of people, which he really documented well with his photographs. And there's a documentary of traveling. He, he called it. It was like for, he was trying to to uh, to highlight what he called this wildlife corridor because we have all these parks. We have everybody's national park, and we have and then we have state parks and county parks and whatever. But they can become little islands, and to to promote the diversity of plants and animals, things need to move back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so um, Carlton and his friends, they did a thousand mile walk, bike ride, paddle, horseback ride in a hundred days um, to kind of demonstrate how you, know, you could move from wilderness to wilderness if you had just a little green and so I thought that was very important and it's really good for people to know uh, because as the economy gets better uh, and, the how and, and there's a demand again for, the, for housing, um, there's going to be a demand for these green quarters. So um, we all already live here. We can't shut down the border. Uh, but there needs to be some balance between um, development and protecting Florida. And uh, not I, I don't think it was this legislative session, but the, the last one, um, uh, a new uh, university uh, was established near, I want to say, Lake Wales. And I think it's, yeah, but, but anyway, the quarter, this wildlife quarter, the, the, the most important part of the quarter in Florida 
kind of, if you drew a line from Fort Myers to Jacksonville, say, um, that section in South Central Florida is the key. And the, I can't think of the name of the, uh, the senator who really pushed the... Uh, he's no longer there. Now he's gone. That university, but also he's been promoting this road, this, uh, this toll road from Fort Myers that will go up to Lake Wales. That's where I got that. That will go right through that. So the university was part of right. that. So I think that would be a bad thing for Florida to, to suddenly have this big toll road going through this area that's so critical to Panthers uh, eventually and to Bears and to probably people and possibly to, to people. But you have to remember, I'm, a, I'm an old border boy, so I love this stuff, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, and I, and I, I love Florida, so, you know, I want to protect it. One of the things, though, that this other terrible thing that's happened, now, I'm not a Pollyanna by any means about Florida, and a lot of those bad news stories are in here, the, the, the invasive uh, reptiles and stuff, but, um, is the springs. This might end up, it might be the tragedy of my, of my life. Uh, when I think of those springs that we would camp at when I was a kid, Alexander Springs, this crystal clear water. You just can't imagine how clear that water was. And to, to feel like you were in an aquarium. It's 72 degrees, you go in there, goosebumps, you could see the, the, Goosebumps on a teenage girl for <laughs> <laughs> not that they were interested in that. Anyway, um, and that has changed. The, the two premier springs in Florida, Wakulla Springs, south of Tallahassee. Uh, the water is now it isn't. It's like you had if you had like a this glass of water, and I put an ounce of milk into. So you can no longer see hundreds of feet. And last time Susan and I was swimming in there, um, and I like to swim out to the rope where you can look down. And this is where the creature from the Black Lagoon is from. Mm -hmm. Where you can look down a hundred feet. And of course now you can look down about ten feet. And Susan sort of there there has there was a fatal alligator attack there at any side. And Susan thought if an alligator came underneath us, we'd see it at the last minute, so we got out of there. <laughs> Silver Springs, which was once, it was the most important tourist attraction in Florida. Um, it started around the time of the Civil War. And by the 50s and 60s, they were getting thousands of visitors a day for the glass bottom boats. It's where the Tarzan films were made. I'm working on a story now about a 96-year-old man who documented that place in his photographs. Mm -hmm. He worked there starting in 1938. When he came, went in there, he was 22 years old, I think. Someone said, uh, Bruce, this is Johnny Weissmiller. Oh, yeah. And so Tarzan picked him up and said, hello, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, the, the water looks a little bit clearer there, but there's all this grass that wasn't there, that's grown because of two things. One, the amount of water that's being sucked out of the ground is amazing. And you have to remember, about 65% of our water use goes to lawns and landscaping. It doesn't go to drinking or showers. It goes to goes to, to, to long, yes. making sure our St. Augustine looks good. So the water level is much lower. At the mean, in, in the meantime, um, a lot of water from the fertilizers and toilets flushing are going back in the aquifer. And years ago, people thought that, boy, that, that water was under the ground for 100 years, and then it would come up slowly and be, be uh, be filtered. Now, we know because of some tests where they put dye in there, it's about two weeks. So you have this water that's full of nutrients coming out of the ground 
and fueling an explosion of, of exotic weeds. So to, to me, the springs, they're like the Grand Canyon of Florida. It's, it, it's the Grand Canyon. I mean, we talk about the, the Everglades. The Everglades are wonderful, too. But interior Florida, it's the springs. And, and the thing <coughs> is, if you've never gone swimming in a spring in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, if you just started, you would think it was pretty nice. But if you have this memory, you were just outraged mm -hmm. by, by this. And uh, we were spending some money on it, and now we're not. And that's just a, a travesty because the spring is like the outlet. It's just part of the things that make Florida Florida. Um, so we've had a long answer to the question. <laughs> so we don't have time for any other question. But in one minute, Jeff, after that, could you say something uplifting about <laughs> about St. Petersburg? Sure. Our <laughs> I'll tell you what, um, I think, and I'm not just BSing you, uh, I would rather live here than any place in Florida because I am a, I'm a city rat and I'm a country mouse. And this is a wonderful city. I grew up in Miami and I, I go down there and there's lots of things I like about Miami. But it's not a user-friendly town. You can't go anywhere. It's an ordeal. Here we can go anywhere. And um, I love the arts uh, community. I love having the arts like the arts are here now. I love being able to go into Publix and buying the New York Times. <laughs> I love the National Public Radio, all that stuff. But yeah, you can go out in the bed and you can see uh, a water spout coming down. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you know, you can catch fish. Four days in a row. You can see alligators. Um, you can kayak all sorts of things. You can kayak. We, got, we, we live in a pretty special place. Um, and, I, I, and I'm glad I live here. Um, well, we're glad you live here, too. Well, and thank so you. I think it's time to say thank you to Jeff Lickenberg. <laughs> You don't have to. I'm going to sit up here, and if you just want to come by and say hello, I would love to to say hello back. If you have a story idea, God bless you. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> uh, if you want to buy a book, all right, I'll sell you. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for having me. It was a real honor. Thank and I, I want to thank all of you for coming. And um, next month. The last Thursday of July will be, um, my guest is going to be Mike Clay, who's the chief meteorologist of Bay News 9. And we're going to talk about weather and hurricanes and storms and why St. Petersburg has a special place in terms of weather. So uh, please come and thank you. Thank you so much for being here.